Good morning, Everett's Bible Fellowship. Welcome to the EBF Virtual Sunday Gathering. My name is Jeff Estes. Uh, I'm the Director of Music and Communications here at EBF, and this is Brady. Um, Again, thanks for joining us. We're so glad that you decided to this morning. Uh, Our call to worship comes from Psalm 113. Listen to this. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, praise the name of the Lord. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks down, far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her joyous, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Amen. Would you worship the Lord together with us this morning through song? I was an orphan lost at the fall, running. foundation you predestined to adopt me as your own you have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone you left your home to seek out the lost you knew the great and terrible cause your face was there. I worked my fingers down to the bone. Nothing I did could ever atone. Just you paid my debt. By your blood I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The Spirit, you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my own. Head full of rocks and heart made of stone. Spirit, you moved in me. At your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. On my darkened heart, the light of Christ did show. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven's citizen by grace and grace alone. Of 
redeem the whole creation You did not despise the cross And for even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit Three in one God of glory Majesty Praise forever to the King of Kings And the morning that you rose All of heaven held its breath Till the stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not kneel and shall not faint his blood and in his name, by his freedom I am free, for the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise forever to the King. Good morning, EBF kids and families. My name is Karis Lancaster, and I'm here to give the lesson again today. Last week, we learned about how Jesus appeared to two disciples on the road. And today we're gonna to talk about him appearing to more of his disciples. We're gonna learn about how they felt and what they saw. And we're also gonna hear about the very important job that Jesus told his disciples to do. Listen closely and see if you can figure out what the job is. Okay, I'll be back in one minute. On the first day of the week, in the evening, the disciples gathered together in a house. They locked the doors because they were afraid of the Jews. They didn't want to be killed like Jesus had been killed. But wait! Jesus had appeared to two disciples on the road, and Mary Magdalene had reported seeing him alive too. Could it be true? As the disciples talked, Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace to you. The disciples were afraid. They couldn't believe their eyes. Was this really Jesus? The disciples thought they were seeing a ghost. Why are you afraid? It's me. Why do you doubt? Jesus said, Look at me and touch me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, but I do. I'm not a ghost. Jesus showed his disciples his hands and his side. They saw the holes in his hands and in his side. Jesus was alive. It seemed too good to be true. 
The disciples rejoiced because they were so happy to see Jesus. The disciples gave Jesus some fish to eat. Jesus talked to them and explained the Bible to them. The Bible is about me, Jesus said. He helped them understand how the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms told about him. Then Jesus told the disciples that they had a job to do. Jesus had died and was raised from the dead so that people could be forgiven for their sins. The disciples needed to tell other people to repent from their sin and be forgiven. Peace to you, Jesus said to them again. God sent me to earth, and in the same way, I am sending you. Jesus sent out the disciples to be his witnesses and to tell all the people that he is alive. For 40 days, Jesus presented himself to at least 500 people and proved that he is alive. Jesus is still alive today. He sends out believers to tell others about him and gives us power through the Holy Spirit. Welcome back. The job of the disciples was to tell others to repent and turn to Jesus. He really rose from the dead, and now the whole world should know. Talk is a family. How did, how did the disciples respond to Jesus? How did they feel when they saw him? What then did Jesus say to comfort them? Okay, this week's memory verse is Mark 16, 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. I'll say that again. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Lastly today, pray as a family. Thank God that Jesus rose from the dead and ask God what it might look like for your family to do the job of telling others about Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you and have a great week, everyone. Good morning, EBF. Our passage this morning is from Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9. So open your Bibles with me. Again, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will, as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church family. As we open God's Word together this morning, I pray that God would meet us right where we are and that He would give us wisdom as we approach this passage that we have just heard read. And I have to admit it is a difficult passage for us to hear even as we grapple with the ongoing effects of chattel slavery in the United States. As we live in a community that has taken the bold step of committing to reparations, and even as we await the outcome of the trial surrounding the killing of George Floyd. My hope, though, is that as we go through this passage this morning, we will see how Paul orients all of life toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And would you join me in praying that he would recalibrate our hearts as we hear his holy word proclaimed today? Would you pray with me? Our Father, we lift up this time to you this morning, and we ask that you would help to translate your word from the first century into the 21st. Would you challenge us in the way that we worship, work, and how we value others, Lord, and in the priorities that we have in life? Holy Spirit, would you illumine your word? Use me as 
your vessel to faithfully communicate your truth. Father, would you clear out those distractions, those things that would keep us from hearing your truth. We pray that, God, that we would not just simply gloss over these challenging words, but that we would see what Paul is doing and saying and that you would enable us to live out these words here and now. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are an estimated 40.3 million modern-day slaves. Let that number sink in. 40.3 million. That is one in every 200 people in the world. This takes the form of such evils as sex trafficking, forced labor, debt bondage, domestic servitude, child labor, and yes, even the the conscripting of child soldiers. 71% are female, 29% are male, one in four is a child. These are almost unfathomable numbers to us. And this is an evil that can often be treated in the abstract, looking at governments and their responses, looking to supply chains and how they contribute to this evil, looking at the risk of imports and exports. But for others, this reality of modern-day slavery is intensely personal. Nadia Murad is a Yazidi from Iraq who is a human rights activist and winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. And in her book, The Last Girl, she tells the harrowing story of how she was captured and enslaved by the Islamic State, and then how she made her daring escape. The last time I was privileged to be in northern Iraq, I had the opportunity to sit down with several Yazidi families in their in their tents, even as they are internally displaced within the country, and to to hear their own stories of neighbors and relatives and friends who were themselves taken as slaves by ISIS. And for them, this is intensely personal. By the way, each one of them had heard of and knew who Nadia Murad was. But behind these astronomical numbers are faces and stories and relationships. For Paul and the early church, this was also intensely personal. About 20% of those in the spreading communities of disciples were themselves slaves. And this concentration was even higher in Rome. And yet there they were, worshiping alongside everyone else in the church. Think of the children, free children and slave children in the Ephesian church, worshiping alongside one another and worshiping alongside those who care for them, be they slave or free or freed men and women. Paul reminds them together that they are fellow heirs with one another, that they are fellow members of the same body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That comes in Ephesians 3, verse 6. He calls them together. uh, He calls them living stones that are being built into God's holy temple. He calls them to live out the gifts that they have been given, whether it be apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. Tradition has it that Onesimus, Philemon's slave, whose story is captured in the book of Philemon, later became the bishop of Ephesus. Paul identifies every believer as his brother or sister, binding them together as fellow adoptees in the beautiful family of God who have been given access together into the throne room of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So as we come to Paul's instructions to bond servants and masters, In Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9, we must do so remembering all of these things, tracing our fingers across the pages of Ephesians, all of these things and more that have come uh, come uh, as a part of Ephesians that contribute to these words then that are given to bondservants and masters. And so in our time together this morning, We're going to explore slavery in the first century world and the instructions that Paul gives. And then 
bridge the first and 21st centuries as we seek its meaning for our lives today. So first, a word on slavery. Slavery in the first century, scholars estimate that slaves would have made up about one-third of a city like Ephesus. People became slaves by birth, by captivity due to war, or even inability to pay debts. And slaves did not merely do menial tasks. No, they did nearly all kinds of work, including some who were very highly educated in professional work. They could own property, for instance, and they were a key part of the household, which is why Paul addresses them in this section on family relationships. It's important to note that slavery in the first century was not based on race. And any notion of inferiority was based on social status rather than race. The ESV uses this word here, you might have heard it in the reading, the word bondservant. And in the Roman Empire, a bondservant was someone bound under a contract to serve someone for a particular length of time, often seven years. I just have to to pause here and say that a lot of effort has gone into explaining how first century slavery was very different than slavery in 19th century America. If you look at the commentators, for instance, there's a lot of of distancing that has attempted uh, to do that. But chattel slavery in the United States was certainly brutal, racist, dehumanizing, and a terrible evil with ongoing effects, effects that are still being felt today. But comparing the two contexts should not lead to painting an overly rosy picture of slavery in the first century. Some things to consider. How slaves were treated pretty much depended on their masters. Some loved, some masters loved their slaves and treated them like family, while others were especially cruel, ruthless, and dehumanizing toward them. And even when a slave was able to gain their freedom, they did not simply become free. No, they joined the ranks of like this third category, those, of, those who were called freed men and women, forever bearing that mark of slavery. It's easy for us to read a passage like this and wonder why Paul didn't call for the end of slavery. We must come to terms that passages like this were once used and abused in the context of slavery in America. But what was Paul really doing here? It's important to remember that he is writing to Christian bondservants and masters within households. And this, he does not provide an exposition on the immorality of institutional slavery. Paul does not condone slavery. Neither does he provide a theological basis for the continuing of slavery. Instead, what Paul does throughout his ministry, what he does is almost like strategically setting the charges that would cause slavery to implode. Picture uh, a building that is being prepared to be imploded, to, to blow up that building. Perhaps it's an old building or one that will be decommissioned, whatever. Think about those tr- the strategic charges that are placed along the way to ensure that the building implodes and and falls right in place. That is like what Paul is doing here. He's setting the charges for the implosion of slavery. So what are some examples of those charges that he sets? Just going to look at a few of those here. I found, by the way, I found Tony uh, Morita particularly helpful in thinking about these ways that Paul sets these charges. And so first, earlier in Ephesians 5, Paul calls us to imitate God. Psalm 68, verse 5 says that God is father of the fatherless and protector of widows. Psalm 146, 9 says that the Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. He is a God of justice and compassion who stands against oppression and rescues the vulnerable. A second charge. In in 1 Timothy 1.10, Paul 
calls trafficking human beings a sin, right alongside lying, murder, and other vile acts. And he uses a particular word there that calls out those who would capture or kidnap others and sell them into slavery. Third, Paul teaches equality among groups. Colossians 3.11 says, Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Fourth, fourth charge that he places. In Philemon, we learn of this slave that I alluded to, this slave named Onesimus, who fled his master Philemon and then encountered Paul and became a follower of Jesus Christ. Paul then writes back to Philemon to welcome Onesimus back. As Philemon 16 says, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a, as a beloved brother. This was a radical redefinition of their relationship. And as we sing every year around Christmas time in the song, O Holy Night, chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Fifth, Paul encouraged believing slaves to seek their freedom. In 1 Corinthians 7, 20 through 21, verse 21 says, But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. And sixth, here in Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, Paul speaks to the Christian community and encourages believing bondservants and masters to treat one another as they would treat Christ himself, to live under the lordship of Christ, and to masters especially, that they would show reciprocity in their relationships, how they, how they address uh, how they address bondservants, bondservants and masters together ought to relate to one another as they pursue Christ together. These charges and more would lead to the eventual implosion of slavery in the Roman world and slavery in the American context. And this is still why we should fight against the evil of modern day slavery today. So let's turn to the instructions themselves that Paul gives, beginning in verse 5. Here we find, in verses 5 through 8, Christ-centered instructions to bond servants. If you remember back to Ephesians 5, verse 21, the spirit-filled submission that Paul talks about is first illustrated by the marriage relationship, then the relationship between children and parents, which we saw last time, and now here between bond servants and masters. And a careful reading of this text is important. It helps us to realize that there are things that are asked of everyone in chapter 5 that are now extended to slaves and masters. Pleasing the Lord, verse 10. Doing the Lord's will, verse 17. And mutual submission. Paul directly addresses bond servants and instructs them in verse 5, Obey your earthly masters. This would have been unprecedented. Traditional household codes focused on how masters should rule over their slaves. Instead, Paul speaks directly to slaves and instead treats them as integral members of the community of faith. There they are right alongside their sisters and brothers, slave and free together. Countercultural, radical move of Paul here. And in what follows, he gives four ways that they are to serve. First, respectfully. Verse 5 says, With fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. This bears similarity with what Paul says in verse 5, 20, uh, or chapter 5, verse 21, the fear of Christ. And in calling them to work respectfully, Paul says that they are actually honoring Christ. He emphasizes their, their sincerity and the reverence in which they do this, working reverently because they are actually honoring Christ. Second, conscientiously. Verse 6 goes on, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. This phrase might seem Hard to decipher at first, but Paul is basically saying, don't be like those who work only when someone is watching them. Here's how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. Don't just do what you have to to get by, but work heartily 
as Christ's servants, doing what God wants you to do. Third, wholeheartedly. Not only should they serve respectfully and conscientiously, but wholeheartedly as well. Verse 6 and 7, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Notice the emphasis on these verses throughout on, on, uh, on the heart, the emphasis on the heart. And the word for good will here in verse 7 is only used here in the New Testament. It basically means zeal or eagerness or wholeheartedness. It reminds us of what Paul would say in a similar passage in Colossians 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And fourth, worshipfully. Did you notice all the phrases as we went along that had the word as in it? All of these phrases that point to Jesus. Verse 5, as you would Christ. Verse 6, as bondservants of Christ. Verse 7, as to the Lord. They are serving the Lord Jesus rather than mere human beings. In verse 8, Paul goes on to give the underlying motivation for all of this when he writes, Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Even when no one else does, God sees their service. That's what he's emphasizing here. And there is an ultimate reward that is coming. Nothing goes unseen. Each one, slave or free, will be rewarded. God does not discriminate. And notice the equal standing in this passage of bond servants and masters, equal in standing before God. We could actually throw this in as a fifth way they are to serve. They are to serve expectantly, expectantly, knowing that there is a reward that is coming. It is at this point that the spotlight turns to Christ-centered instructions to masters. And we are given uh, this, again, the same pattern where Paul directly addresses masters and gives them this instruction. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening. Do the same to them. It's almost like you blink and you miss that phrase, but this would have been completely shocking. Do the same to them. Do you catch the revolutionary and radical nature of that statement? This means masters treating bond servants as we just captured, treating bond servants respectfully, conscientiously, wholeheartedly, worshipfully, and expectantly, rather than a superior inf inferior relationship. Paul pictures a reciprocal relationship. Of the ancient writers, only Paul goes so far as to say that masters should do the same to bond servants as they do to them. And so another charge is set. That alone should have blown up slavery among Christians. Stop your threatening. It stands in stark contrast to the expectation of the day that masters would deal with their slaves ruthlessly and how, however they please. Instead, Paul calls them to be treated humanely, to be treated with kindness and compassion. This is not just a golden rule here. This is not just saying treat them as we would want to be treated. No, this goes beyond the Christ rule, treating others as we would treat the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As Paul did with bond servants in providing the underlying motivation, so he does with masters. Look at the rest of verse 9 knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. This is a call for masters to live with a fear of Christ. God is the judge of all people, regardless of whether they are slave or free. He does not favor one group of people over another, and he judges each person by his own standards, including how they treat their fellow image bearers. Christ gives equal dignity and worth to every human being. This is grounded in the Old Testament too, in the fact that God does not show partiality. Deuteronomy 10 verse 17 says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, 
the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. And this is equal, this sort of equal dignity and worth is reflected in what Paul writes in Galatians 3.28 when he writes, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. As we turn the corner here into how bridging from the first century into the 21st century, it might be easy to dismiss this whole passage as not speaking to us today. But what I want for us to do is to dig deeper, to see how it relates to our lives and how we worship, how we work, the values that we hold, how we value people, and in the priorities that we have. So first, first takeaway is this. This text should challenge how we worship. Klein Snodgrass, writing on this passage, says this, The very form of this text is an indictment of modern-day churches. As passages like this show, early Christian congregations were made up of a cross-section of society, but the usual valuations of the society were rejected. In most of our churches, the valuations of society are retained so that no real cross-section comes together. We have churches for different socioeconomic groups. We do not draw people to a common place where hierarchies and valuations are set aside and people know they stand on equal footing before God. As long as a church is a group of our kind, it fails its mission. Sisters and brothers, the church should be a beautiful community where people with diverse backgrounds, races, socioeconomic statuses, and more, come together as equals, united in the common cause of Christ. This passage and others should radically challenge how we worship. And not only that, it should challenge how we work. In applying this text, this is where most people go, that these are general principles that should help us in thinking through our workplace relationships, the responsibilities of employees and, and employers. And I think I think that's right. I think that's good to draw out some of those lessons. But I think the text actually even goes beyond that, as we will see. But first, let's focus here on on thinking through our own work as employees and as employers. Employees should remember that every task falls under the Lordship of Christ, no matter how seemingly menial. I love this story that is told of a time when President John F. Kennedy was visiting the NASA Space Center in 1962 and he he noticed a janitor that was off in the corner and was sweeping and he interrupted the tour to go over and ask this particular janitor what he was doing. And that janitor's response, well, Mr. President, I'm helping put a man on the moon. Most people might have seen his work and just thought he's he's cleaning his he's cleaning the building as he's as he's supposed to, but He saw how what he was doing contributed to the larger unfolding story. And no matter how seemingly small our role, we are contributing to the larger story that God is writing. That story that he's writing in our lives, in our work, whatever organization we might be a part of. And yes, even in his very mission. What do we do when no one is looking? Do we only work while being watched or perhaps to win the boss's favor? Do we do only what we have to do to get by? As followers of Jesus Christ, our work should be done in an exemplary way that does not require close supervision. The workplace is a great place to make Jesus look good and to sow seeds of the gospel. All work should be done wholeheartedly as to Christ and as to serve Christ and not to please people. Even as we work for Christ, now we remember that there is a heavenly reward that is coming. Remember that our jobs do not determine who we are. Christ does. And everything we do should be done in, to, and for our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's one challenge for us to consider. And that is, before you go to work, pray for the Holy Spirit of God to fill you and to use you as his ambassador in your workplace. It could be during your commute or 
if you're working from home before you hop on Slack or whatever it is, pray that God would use you in your place of work. To employers, I think this provides challenge to us to consider as well, that we lead through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul reveals the daily pressure and anxiety he faced for all the churches he served in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight, 28. And then he says just a few verses later in chapter 12, verse 9, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Employers must lead out of Christ's strength and not our own. Employers should lead the way that Jesus does. Jesus displayed servant leadership. He came to serve. He took up the towel. He scandalous, scandalously cared for the marginalized. He sought no earthly praise and is our example as a kind and caring shepherd. And so for Christian employers as well, lead as those who will have to give an account. Remember who our audience is, the Lord himself. We will all stand before him and will all be called to give an account for what and who God entrusted to our care. You know, the lessons from these verses push even beyond employer and employee relationships. And so in our time remaining, I just want to take a look at at two more of those. First, actually, this is our, our third takeaway. This text should challenge how we value people. From an early age, we pick up on cues from people around us and even from society at large concerning our relative value and maybe even where we fall in the, in the broader hierarchy. But this passage pushes back on that hierarchy and instead grounds our value in Christ himself. Yes, we might have different roles, gifts, experiences, but that does not make us any more or less valuable. Our value and identity is not determined by our circumstances. Our value comes ultimately from Christ. We are all equal image bearers and will all face the same judgment. There is no room for arrogance toward others or even feelings of superiority. Romans 2.11 says, For God does not show favoritism. And if that's the case, why would we? And yet, we so easily fall into patterns of favoring those in power, those that are in the limelight, those who have the wealth. On the flip side, we often ignore or even demean those who are poor. They might be in service jobs or who often go unnoticed in society. Are we quick to chew out waitresses and retailers when things don't go our way? Does our attitude, our our body language, our our lack of eye contact convey that we really don't care about them? The fact of the matter is that these people are just as important and valuable as any public figure, any star athlete, any A-list actor. Both favoritism toward the powerful and dehumanization of the powerless are sins. And this text challenges us to relate to both as we would to Christ himself. And so one small challenge I would give us is that when we encounter perhaps waitresses, cashiers, janitors, whatever the role, let's look them in the eye, greet them, ask for and use their name, and thank them for what they do. Another challenge, even as we think about the continued horrors of modern-day slavery, that we would have our antennas up for suspected sex trafficking or labor trafficking that might be happening in our very own community. This text should challenge how we value our fellow image bearers. And last, this text should challenge what we prioritize. Think about who we go through life trying to impress. We spend so much of our lives trying to gain the respect of certain people. It might be in how we dress, although apparently I'm not trying to impress anyone right now, but it might be how hard we work when those we are trying to impress are watching us. 
This passage challenges us that we have an audience of one, and that audience is the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to Him. We are called to serve Him and to serve Him wholeheartedly with reverence and awe. And so here's the bottom line. Very similar to last week, even as we considered the relationship between children and parents, what we do and how we do it matters in family relationships, workplace environments, and beyond, because all of life should be lived in, to, from, through, and for the Lord Jesus Christ. People, including those who are often ignored, and tasks, even those that might seem the most menial, are to be handled with care as an expression of our heartfelt worship to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ left the glory of heaven to seek and to save the lost. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life ultimately as a ransom for many. He became the suffering servant and did for us what we could not do on our own. He freed us from slavery to sin and brought us into a loving relationship with the Father He came to give us what we could not earn for ourselves, new life, resurrection life, new life in Him. He came to make us what we could never become on our own, no longer slaves, but sons and daughters of the King. In reflecting on this great truth and the posture of humility that Jesus took, I can think of no greater place in Scripture that reveals the heart of God in this than in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. So, in fact, flip a page or two over to that and follow along with me as we consider the humility of Christ. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen, church. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you for that picture of humility that we have in Philippians 2. We praise you for what you did that we could not. We praise you that we are no longer slaves, but that we are sons and daughters of the King because of your shed blood on the cross. Father, we pray that our church would indeed blossom into a beautiful community with people from diverse backgrounds committed to loving Jesus together. We pray for our work to be done wholeheartedly to please you rather than to please people. And Father, we pray that you enable you would enable us to value people the way we, that we ought, to give them the, worthy, the, the worth and the respect and the dignity that is due to them simply by being an image bearer. And Father, we pray that every aspect of our lives would be lived in, to, from, through, and for the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in the precious and matchless name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. 
To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valleys he will lead. All the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ. I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. Good morning, EBF. My name is Matt Wright, and I'm one of the elders. Welcome to EBF. We're so happy that you joined us this morning. At EBF, we describe ourselves as a community of sojourners empowering one another to cultivate gospel transformation. If this is your first time with us, we'd love to connect with you and give you some more information about EBF and connect you to others. Please fill out the connection card, which is available by scanning the QR code, which is on your screen, or clicking on the link that's in the video description. We're continuing our pop-up prayer gatherings, but this week we're partnering the prayer gathering with our Evanston Cleanup Day. The pop-up prayer gathering will begin at 10 a.m. and go for roughly one hour, and after, we'll spend time as a church cleaning up a part of Evanston. For more information, open the Church Center app and tap on the button at the bottom of the home screen if you have any questions, you can reach out to Chelsea Sherlock at chelsea at ebfchurch.org. 
please make sure to pre-register for the event using the Church Center app. I'd also like to give you an update this morning on where we stand financially as we head into the end of our fiscal year. As of March 1st, or sorry, March 31st, our full year-to-date budget was $514,613. Our actual year-to-date expenses were around $400,000, and our actual giving was around $330,000. So this leaves us with a shortfall year-to-date of around $69,700. I'd like to give a little context for those numbers. First, our expenses for the last fiscal year have been a little lower than expected in the budget because we have not been meeting at the MIC and have not had to pay rent. And second, we haven't had a full staff because Tim joined us uh, later in the fiscal year. And third, through careful management of our expenses by the staff and the ministry leaders, we've been able to keep expenses under control but you can still see that there's a little bit of a shortfall in giving. And I'll note that the shortfall does not include the PPP loan that we approved in our last members meeting for $56,000. So moving forward, we expect that our expenses will be much more in line with what our budget is. And so we will now have a full staff and we hope to be able to start meeting together in person and doing all the ministry that uh, we include in our budget. So we wanna continue to invest in EBF, in our staff and in our gospel-centered ministry in Evanston, Northwestern and our surrounding community and really to the whole world through our missionaries. I'm gonna share a passage of scripture with you. This is 1 Corinthians 16, one through two. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. First, I wanna praise God for how he has met our needs, even in this year when we're in sight of seeing our income meet our expenses. God has been really good to us. If God has especially blessed you this year, I'd invite you, uh, even in the midst of the pandemic and the uncertainty of of financial situations, to consider putting aside a little bit more to invest in the ministry at EBF. And I challenge you to think about this, not just this week, but going forward um, as our budget will uh, be established for the coming year, we wanna think about Uh, what our needs are going to be going forward. Perhaps you've received some stimulus funds that are in excess of your current needs. Uh, Or maybe you've been a part of our body and you just haven't started giving regularly yet or sacrificially setting aside money each week as Paul directed churches to do. So I invite you to pray about this in the coming weeks, asking God if he would lead you to give regularly to the ministry here at EBF so that we can both finish this year in strong financial condition and also uh, plan for more ministry in the coming fiscal year. So information on how to give is on the screen. You can text the amount you want to give to 84321. You could use the Church Center app or you can mail a check to the EBF office. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that everything belongs to you and that you give us all that we need and that we owe every blessing to you. I pray that just as you've been so faithfully uh, giving to us in the past, that you'd continue to meet the needs of EBF. Thank you for giving us the privilege of being stewards of the resources that you've given to us. Give us wisdom as we make decisions about finances and as we use your gifts. In your name we pray, amen. Now receive the benediction from Colossians 3, 23 through 24. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Go in peace.